What's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode 74 of the Around the Crease podcast. This week, we're talking with University of Delaware assistant coach Trey Wilkes, and we're talking with him about recruiting. We're asking him questions like, how do you get noticed, whether it matters whether or not you're on the East Coast or anywhere else in the country, what things a player can do to make sure a college coach has noticed them, and also what non-athletic things a player can do to help them get noticed and be recruit- more recruitable. And we're starting now. All right, I'm here with uh, Coach Trey Wilkes. He's assistant coach at the University of Delaware, and today we're going to talk a little bit about recruiting, kind of hopefully get some of the, the most popular questions that, that players and probably parents uh, have as far as like to, to try and demystify some of the recruiting process. Coach, thank you for being on the podcast this week. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, Mike. I, I First off, I want to thank you for, for allowing me this opportunity to come out and, and, and talk with you. Uh, it's It's honestly, it's it's something that uh, that I'm really excited about personally. As you know, we've we've talked in the past. Um, you know, I, I I followed you as a young as a young player in high school and even in college because you uh, you had the honor in, <laughs> in uh, following Western Maryland sports, football, and lacrosse, which I was a part of. And so uh, you know, I I just I'm very thankful for the opportunity. I'm excited to spend some time with you this evening. Yeah, it was a small small world when we figured out that Ur- that Urbana connection. <laughs> that Absolutely, was, was man. Go unexpected. Hawks. Yeah, exactly. Go Hawks to you. Yeah, I'm sure so any, anybody from Urbana listen to this will be very happy. And how how often you have that uh, have that tie in? Uh, um, but anyway, so we're gonna kind of get into the questions. We have some questions that we kind of talked about for anybody listening. We're not gonna get into specific players or specifics about the University of Delaware. We're trying to keep it kind of general, so as many people can take something out of this as possible. So we won't talk specifically about one college or obviously no players or anything like that. And then I have a list of questions that um, some kids off Instagram had asked as well that wanted to know. So if we don't cover any of those over the course of our talk, we'll ask those at the end. Um, But we're going to start with probably the most obvious question, and it is literally the number one question that I get um, almost from anybody. And it really is like, how do you get noticed by a college coach? And I know that's a pretty broad and (laughs) that could be its own podcast in and of itself, but um, what are some things that, that you have, how would you answer that question? Yeah, no, absolutely. So first I just, I want to, I want to start by saying that, listen, the, the recruiting process and, and just the recruiting world in general and our, and our profession as college coaches, um, you know, it's something that we, that we talk about and we think about every day, um, every moment of the day, you know, I mean, even, even at times, you know, you could argue that we talk about it more than, than we maybe even do our own team. Um, because, you know, in the summertime, our, our team's at home, they're not in school. And so, and we're still talking about recruiting. And even during the school year, um, you know, when we're, when we're planning practices and we're, we're getting our team prepared for competition, um, we're still talking about recruiting, you know, and on the weekends when we're at home with our families, we're still thinking about recruiting. So I think it's important for, for, for people to understand parents and players, high school coaches, club coaches that, listen, this is something that we don't turn on and off. You know, this process, there, it's not an, an exact science. Um, with that being said, there is a lot of thought and energy that's going into it because at the end of the day, it, it is a direct correlation to the success of our program, the type mm-hmm. of person, the kid uh, you know, the young man that's coming to our into our locker room, the type of athlete on the field, the type of person that he is in the, in the, the classroom and in the community, those those things are are instrumental in, in the success we have as a program. So, um, you know, I think that at times the, the recruiting process becomes, I think, in some people's eyes, very transactional. And they think that it's just it's all about what event you're at and, you know, what team you're playing for and how many times you're playing in the summer and what is a coach exactly looking for? You know, there, it, again, it's not an exact science, um, but it is a never ending, um, you know, never ending uh, part of our, our job, a process of our job as college coaches. And, you know, we, we want to make sure that we're not missing a lot and that we're bringing in the right guys. So, you know, I think starting with that, it, it opens nicely kind of just into the topic of how, we, how to get noticed by college coaches. I mean, you know, one of the things that, um, I'll see a lot in emails or that a lot of coaches see in emails or that we'll talk to college or high school and club coaches rather, uh, about, you know, this kid's a great kid. You know, mm-hmm. he does really great in the classroom and, um, you know, he does, you know, he's a part, he, he's all constantly you know, involved in the community and he's a part of different youth groups or, uh, he's, you know, he's a multi-sport athlete, whatever the case may be. 
you know, there, listen, we get it. There, there are a ton of, a lot of great kids out there that work really hard and do well in the classroom, do all those things. But at the end yeah. of the day, you got to be able to play the game, right? Like that's, <laughs> that's what we're, that's what we're here to do. You know, we're here to help mentor young men to, to becoming the best versions of, them, of themselves, but we're doing that through the game of lacrosse. And so, um, I always think it's very important for, for people to understand that first off, there's a place, there's a place for everyone to play. Uh, there's so many different opportunities to play collegiately, whether it's D1, D2, D3, mm-hmm. MCLA, um, you know, there's there, there's NAIA. I mean, there's there's so many different opportunities. So I think that as long as you truly love the game and you want to just play and have the ability to be a part of something um, that's bigger than yourself and you, you have, you know, uh, you're willing to be a part of a team goal and winning, wanting to win games and, and, and do stuff in the locker room and in the community. I mean, I think that that's that's the first thing that's really important is, you know, do you have a desire to play regardless mm-hmm. of the level? I think there's the one thing, the, the saddest thing that I see and hear the most are, are kids that say D1 or bust. Right. And it's like, well, I'm either going to play Division one lacrosse or or not at all. Yeah. And and to be honest, that that's that's kind of a red flag for for any Division one coach, because it's like, well, listen, that doesn't really tell us that you love the game that all that much. Right. And, you know, I can remember being a high school kid not long, not too long ago. Um, you know, for me, I, I never, yeah, I had aspirations and dreams and goals of playing division one lacrosse. But at the end of the day, it was more it, to me, what was more important was that I was going to play collegiately and be a part of something that was bigger than myself. And it was also going to help me just become a better person and prepare yeah. me for the next chapter in life. So, um, you know, kind of with going all of, into all of that, I think in terms of getting noticed, right, I think your game has to be, you know, your number one priority. You know, mm-hmm. what are you doing to become a better player? I think with the new rules today, um, you know, in the last two years, really, you know, the new rule of, of, of us college coaches at the Division One level specifically not being able to contact a kid till September 1 of his junior year, um, that really changes the timeline for a lot of kids. You know, you're not having to focus on being recruited as a freshman and sophomore, having to um, attend as many events, recruiting events as possible, you know, you now have the opportunity as a player going into high school to just focus on your game. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, you know, depending on what age group you're talking about, you know, I kind of categorize that sophomore class and younger. Your your job right now in terms of getting noticed by a college coach coach should be, you know, training, practicing, um, doing as the you know as well as you possibly can in in, in the classroom um and and just being a good person playing as many sports as possible you know that's something that i think it's a hot topic in today's society is is you know, that, that multi-sport athlete i think it's critical especially with the new rule mm-hmm. um it just allows you to develop in so many different ways you know one of the examples i, I use a lot when talking to kids um the, the, the opportunity to play multiple sports is going to help you grow as an athlete, not just on, on the field, but in terms of what your role is in the locker room or on, on, you know, within your team. So the example I would give is if you're a stud, uh, you know, division one lacrosse prospect, you're the guy, you know, you're a starter since you were a freshman. Um, but you on, on your basketball team or your soccer team or your hockey team or your football team, maybe you're not the guy or maybe you're, you know, maybe you're the first guy off the bench or maybe you're, you know, the second string guy. You know, you're having to learn how to fulfill a role that's much different than the role that you currently have as a high school lacrosse player, Mm -hmm. but might be very similar to the role that you would have as a college athlete coming in as a freshman, right? I mean, you're going to be competing with guys that have been in in that college program for for a couple of years. And so that role might fit more to the role that you have as a basketball player or a soccer player or a hockey player. Mm -hmm. You know, the other the other big piece to that is the coaching, you know, the type of coach you're around, right? Your lacrosse coach, you might vibe with him very well. His coaching style might match your playing style, but your basketball coach might be different. Maybe he gets on you a little bit differently, or maybe he's a little bit more laid back. And so that's going to prepare you not only for the next level of being able to work with different coaches, but even when you go into the real world after college and you're, you know, getting a job and you're working with different people, it allows you to be a great teammate, a great employee, a great coworker, um, and so I think it's just important for kids to understand that in terms of where you are in the process, really live in that moment. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously as you start to get closer to September one of your junior year, your priorities have to start to change. You know, you're still doing all those things, right? You're still doing well in the classroom. You're still continue, you know, you're still practicing, you're still playing multiple sports if that's what you choose to do. But now you are having to start to narrow things down. And so I think that's when the prospect days and the showcases and, um, those those other you know outside outside resources that allow you to get in front of college coaches those things start to come into play, um, 
And so I guess I just threw a lot at you there. Are there yeah. Is there anything specific that you want to, you know, maybe maybe lead into in terms of the showcases and prospect days versus club team stuff um, or high school events like NHSLS? Um, you know, are there any things that you that you would like to maybe directly uh, talk about? Well, I guess it's more like it sounds like obviously there's not there's really not one way a kid would really get noticed. It sounds like I mean, it sounds like it's like one, a combination of factors. But, you know, if, it, if I'm a kid and I'm interested in. Ohio State, like, and the coaches have maybe at that point, like, have no idea. Maybe I'm a sophomore and, yeah. you know, I play in, you know, we'll, we'll just say in Illinois because I'm located in Illinois. Um, and I want to, like, oh, you know, I'm interested in Ohio State and, like, and I want to get noticed by an Ohio State coach. Like, how would a player do something along that nature? If they, like, they want to play D1 or if they want to play any level, but how would they go about something like that? Totally. So I think that. Um, you know, as you do start to, to creep into that sophomore year where you, maybe you just finished your sophomore year of high school, you know, your lacrosse season and you're kind of you're starting to, you know, um, you're, you're starting your summer circuit of whether it's playing for a club team or attending different recruiting events. I think it's always important to initiate some form of contact. Um, also understanding that 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 form of contact can't be reciprocated. Right. So right. Um, if, a, if a kid that's a sophomore freshman in high school, um, you know, a player rather that's that's that hasn't reached September one of their of their their junior year, um, that player can can email us as many times as he want, um, and and so you know including information like this is my name. I think it's really important to include your grad year. I can't tell you how many kids send emails that don't include their grad year or even their position, and so that always puts us in a tough spot because if you don't include your grad year, like we don't know if we can contact you at all, right? right. You and wouldn't so, even know. And I'm guessing you probably just err on the side of caution and don't email to- them. <laughs> totally, totally. So I think you know drafting together an email and, and definitely establishing some type of connection that you are interested um, in that program is a great start. Um, obviously you know, once that, that contact is, is initiated in terms of, Hey, I'm interested in your school, you know, you by sending an email, then it's, it's definitely making sure that you're attending the right events. I mean, here's, here's the one event that you can pretty much guarantee, uh, an opportunity that you're going to be seen by that staff is a prospect day, right? Mm-hmm. Most, uh, all schools now, even junior colleges are offering prospect days, which to me, uh, you know, as a coach, and even when I was a player, I think, I think I felt and feel is, is a home run. I mean, you, you know, there's a guarantee that you're going to go see that, that campus and see what that feels like and looks like. You're going to be coached by that staff. You're going to be surrounded most of the times by their players. And you're going to see what a typical day may, may look like at that, at that school. And so, you know, I think pursuing a prospect day is always a great option. Now, I think it's also smart in knowing, you know, where do you stand? You know, although you aren't being recruited as a sophomore freshman, you know, I think it's important for a young player and a parent, um, to entrust in someone, whether it's a high school coach or a club coach, or maybe even just a family member or a friend who's played at the college level and mm-hmm. give you some type of, um, you know, just evaluation of, Hey, listen, you know, you are a little bit of a later late bloomer. So you may not get your door knocked on early by, by a division one guy or a division two guy, maybe down the road you will. But I think it's important for kids and parents to really sit back and say, where do I stand physically and, and, and athletically, um, and, and before they start just going and signing up for all these different things. Right. Um, I think that going with all that is, and going into all that as well. And, and something I should have touched on earlier, you know, as a freshman and sophomore, like, you know, you're, you're trying to develop yourself and prepare yourself for that moment when you can finally be evaluated. And I think right now with the new rule, we're all still trying to figure it out. But at the division one level, we're truly not starting to look at those at players until the summer really going into their junior year. Yeah. So that for, for as a younger player, you know, now like, Hey, listen, if you have an opportunity between going to a showcase as a freshman, going into your sophomore year or a prospect day or, uh, staying at home and shooting a hundred balls in your backyard every day or seeing a hundred shots or, you know, training as a face off guy or working on your footwork, like, you know, think about what, you know, what weigh your options out, what, what is going to provide more value for you. So that way, when you are ready to be recruited, you're at you're at your pinnacle, right? Yeah. Like you are, you've hit that that standard where you feel like you you have the best opportunity to get recruited. So, um, yeah, I think I think as I think another great opportunity, especially as you're going into that junior year, you know, hitting a showcase, because I think that'll also help you gauge your interest. If you if you can hit a showcase, maybe um, you know, going into your junior year, and it, I'm not saying that you have to do it, mm-hmm. but it might give you that ability to kind of put yourself out there, and then that way when September one does come you start to field some of those phone calls. If you're a guy that's not getting a ton of division one calls, if you're getting a lot of D two, D three contact, you know, 
now you kind of know where you stand. Yeah. And if your goal is still is to play Division One, then you know you still have some work to do, and there is still time. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that if you want to hit two or three prospect days going into your junior year, to you know, and hit different schools, hit you know a Division One school, hit a Division Three school. If you're going to hit two Division Threes or two Division Twos or two Division Ones, do two different schools. Hit a school that's maybe more rural. Hit another school that's a little bit more urban. Yeah. Um, or a big school versus a small school. That was one thing that my parents, I think, did such a great job of when I went through the process um, of, of allowing me to see the differences, right? Of understanding, like, hey, listen, this is, you don't know what you want. And, and I always love when a kid says, well, I want a big school. <laughs> well, how do you know you want a big school? You've never been to a big school. You never, right. you've never attended a big school. You don't know what it's like to go to a big school until you've actually attended it. So um, I think the more research you can do and the more experiences you can have by attending these different events, the better. Um, with also understanding that, listen, you don't need to go to every single thing. I mean, some of these yeah. kids play 20 to, in 20 different things throughout a summer, um, and it's just too much. By yeah. the end of the summer, you're burnt out. Um, so hopefully that, that kind of answers that question Yeah. Um, in terms of the, of the timeline and the process and what that looks like. Yeah, and I'm going to ask question this, the next question because I know, I know there's a lot of kids that will want me to ask it anyway, but does it, does it matter where you're located? Does this process change if you're located you know, versus East Coast where the hotbeds are, you know, versus the Midwest, the Southeast, like the West Coast? Like I know the – you know, obviously kids have to travel and stuff like that. So, you know, as far as that process, it's going to be different that you're not located in Baltimore, you know, maybe 20 minutes from, <laughs> from the NHS LS, but from as far as like a getting notice um, perspective, like, does it matter where you're from as far as like the things you need to do to make that happen? It's a great question. So uh, the short answer is no, it does not matter anymore. And, and the reason why I believe that, uh, and in my opinion, I think a lot of coaches feel this way because of the growth of our sport. Um, and I think also because of social media and the ability to um, go online and find a kid's highlight tape in the matter of seconds. Mm -hmm. I think that if you are doing things the right way and you are being proactive, uh, you, you'll, you'll, you'll get found. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, like to, I, I really like to believe that the process works itself out. And so, you know, I, I was just explaining to you before we, before we got started, you know, I've, I, in the last month, you know, I've been in Colorado and San Francisco and Long Island and, and, uh, Columbus, Ohio and Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and Baltimore and, um, you know, a couple other places I'll be in Massachusetts this weekend. So, you know, we're all over the place. And so we're definitely, we're not in, in an age, you know, of our sport now where we're just kind of limiting ourselves to the East coast. Mm -hmm. Um, or just to the mid Atlantic or just to the Northeast. Um, you know, we have the ability now that, that to, to recruit everywhere. And I think kids now have the ability also to, to, um, you know, play in a lot of different of, of events and, ex and, and, and expose themselves to any program. And I think with technology, they have the ability to get in touch or at least send their information out, um, and, and get their, get themselves out there. Now, what I, what I will add to that is, is um, it, it might be a little bit more difficult in that, you know, if you're in an area where lacrosse isn't popular and you're not, um, you may be not being coached by a guy who's played collegiately or a guy who's ever played at all, or you're playing with a group of players where, um, you know, you're not being pushed every day. I like, th those are certain, those are certainly challenges, but those things happen everywhere. I mean, I grew up in Western Maryland and, you know, where, when I grew up in Western Maryland, lacrosse was light years behind Baltimore, even though we were, you know, an hour down the road. Right. Um, and that was just because I didn't have those same resources that a kid in Baltimore had growing up. You know, I didn't, I wasn't born with a stick in my hand. Um, I didn't have a coach who played collegiately. You know, I didn't play with a lot of guys or, you know, had a lot of guys that maybe played before I did at my high school that I could relate to or talk to or, you know, seek advice from. And so, you know, there, there are kids like that on the East coast still. Um, and so I think it's important for people to understand that if you, if you put in the work and, and you're, and you're being proactive nowadays, it's, you, it, no, it does not hurt you to be from a non-traditional area and, and, and to get on a coach's radar. The, the resources are there. You just you just have to put be proactive. Yeah, and I had a, a kid we talked about earlier, but he was at, from Instagram asked, what if you're about from a small place that no one knows about? And I mean, I would almost kind of have to to somewhat lump you into that situation because, you know, Urbana, you know, whereas I was growing up, it was a football power. Um, you know, I don't remember it being so much lacrosse. Recently, I know they've made great strides in lacrosse. Totally. But, I mean, you say Maryland, and, of course, you think, Oh, it's Maryland, but 
when you think Maryland, like most people think Baltimore, near MIA and stuff like that. Like it's even in, within the state, it's a little bit segregated. So like, I don't know if many people are looking at Urbana as as far as like, oh, you know, oh, the totally. Maryland, Maryland powerhouse. So I mean, I think you've kind of made the point that, you know, especially nowadays, I'm sure it's probably easier for kids now than maybe it was when you were coming up because obviously you can put your highlights on YouTube and you can get it out. And obviously the pro, like I added the uh, uh, prospect questionnaires for all the D1 schools to the website last week. So I mean, almost every school has one of those. So there's, you guys have made it about as easy as possible for a kid that's interested in your programs to express yeah. that interest. You yep. still gotta, you still gotta put in the work. I mean, I don't think there's no, there's no shortcut. I mean, if any kids out there are hoping for some sort of shortcut to get noticed, like, Oh, I need to attend this one event and that's going to be the magic bullet. Like that doesn't exist. Like you to- gotta totally. put in the work. Yeah. A couple things with that. I mean, you, you know, I, I would be naive to, to, to say that, you know, a kid that plays in the MIAA, you know, is it doesn't have an advantage over a kid from Kansas, right? right. Like, obviously, right? Those, yeah. those, no doubt. And a kid that, that has that opportunity and is fortunate enough to play on, you know, in Long Island, on Long Island or in Baltimore for an MIA school um, or upstate, you know, any of those hotbed areas, New Jersey public, private, uh, Philly private and public. I mean, there's so many um, hotbeds in the area, but they, they are definitely, they're, they're, I would say that they're at an advantage. Um, but I think that you still have the opportunity as a kid from a non-traditional area more so now than you did 10 years ago. And so what I would say to that, that the young man who asked that question, um, you know, it just means you've got to be a little bit more proactive and listen like that, that was me. And, and to be honest, I, I'm actually very grateful for that because what you'll learn as a kid from a non-tra- non-traditional area, um, growing up and playing lacrosse and trying to get recruited you're, you're going to develop a chip on your shoulder, right? You're, you're going to, att- you're going to attend events and, and play at things where you're going to be the guy that no one really knows where you came from. Um, and so you're probably going to have to prove yourself a little bit more than, you know, than a kid that does come from a hotbed area. But guess what? When you enter the locker room in college, it's the same, you're, you're, that's that same process. You know, I always make the joke when I got to Ohio state, you know, I was so excited because there was 14 other guys that were from Maryland but then I looked around the room and looked at everyone's hometowns and high schools. I was the only public school kid from Maryland. Yeah. And so that, and, and let alone the only kid from Western Maryland. And so that chip on my shoulder that I had kind of developed uh, without even knowing as, as a high school, you know, prospective student athlete kind of carried me, carried over into my college career. And it actually, it, it helped me. I think, I think it kept me, uh, you know, grounded and, and it made me work a little bit harder and it made me feel like I still had something to prove. And so I wouldn't count yourself out as a kid that's from a non-traditional area or a place where no one knows. I think if anything, use it to your advantage, right? It's, it's all perspective. If, if you think that it's going to hurt you, then guess what? It's probably going to hurt you. It's yeah. going to probably, it, it probably will be a disadvantage. If you think it's just another obstacle that's going to make you a little bit stronger and a little bit, uh, you know, more of a fighter to get out there and prove yourself, then guess what? Like it, it it's going to be a positive experience for you. So, yeah. um, you know, for that guy that's out there, you know, just, just be smart, do a little bit more research than, than maybe most kids and make sure that you're, you know, and tr- trusting in someone that can help you, you know, and point you in the right direction and don't be afraid to ask for help. You know, I think that's yeah. also really important as well. Yeah. I think that's, that's probably one of the most key things is your perspective. I remember talking with Alex Slusher who went to Oregon Episcopal in Oregon. He's yep. now headed to Princeton. And when I interviewed him for a story on the site, he said, you know, he, he kind of took it upon himself. He's like, he knew he's from Oregon and he would go to events and, kids would kind of be like, oh, you're, you're from Oregon. And it would be totally. kind of that, that thing that he, yeah. he was like, so he took that as he's like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to show him like, you know, he took yeah. it as a, you know, he took it as no a doubt. challenge. He didn't take it as like, oh yeah, I'm from Oregon. Like he didn't. So it's this completely perspective and you can see how you could see it either way, but obviously he worked it to his advantage. And I mean, not that everybody's going to go to Princeton, but there's a way that you can work that to your advantage. And like you said, play with a chip and you know, totally. coaches will probably notice that you do that often enough. Coaches tend to notice the kids that scrap and fight a little bit harder and run off the field instead of jog off the field. And all the, all those little things when you don't think coaches are watching, you guys are no watching. Doubt. <laughs> no doubt. And I just think with, with technology today, like, and, and here's the thing, like at the end of the day, we are college lacrosse coaches. Lacrosse is what we probably know the best, right? I mean, it's what we see, it's what we've played, it's what we do. If there's a ball player out there that can play, we're going to find them, right? You know, we, we as coaches talk so much about who we see and who we like. We have connections with high school coaches all over the country. If you're a guy that can play at the next level, it, it is, to be honest with you, in today's age, I would be shocked that there are any kids that are missing out, you know, playing mm-hmm. collegiately, that is. Not necessarily just at the division level, but playing collegiately. So 
um, you know, I, I think for all kids in today's world, it's it's an exciting time because, um, you know, you're starting to even see kids internationally get recruited, not just Canada, but you know, uh, I, I think there's a there's a kid at Cornell that's from Australia, you know, so it's mm. it's pretty it's pretty cool, you know. I think I think our sport's growing and it's really exciting and. Um, you know, I think for kids from non-traditional areas, you're, you know, you're watching kids play now on national television in the final four and national championship that are from non hotbed areas that, that should be exciting. That should be motivating. You know, yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I have, I'm going to say kind of skip a question here, but is, uh, one of the questions that actually someone asked on Instagram is walking on at a D one program. Is that a thing? Is that yeah, possible? Absolutely. So it definitely changes, uh, institution to institution. Um, it happens I, from what from what I know and what I've experienced and, and from just talking to different coaches. It, I would say it hope it happens at every level, um, Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three, JUCO, um, MCLA. It happens everywhere. Um, and so I think that where it might not happen as much is at the Division One level. But what I'll tell you is is that um, I've experienced it as a coach and as a player. Um, and I'll tell you, man, some of the kids that come into your locker room through that process end up being some of your best leaders, mm -hmm. some of your hardest workers, because, you know, they got to that institution on their own. Right. So there's a lot of kids that will be recruited to play at the division one level or at any level rather. And maybe lacrosse was kind of their ticket into that institution. Whereas you have a kid coming in that has gone in completely on his own, you know, and has had to work a lot harder maybe in the classroom to get there. And so, um, you know, some of the, the best kids, not necessarily on the field, but just best people um, holistically that I've had the, the fortunate fortune of coaching are walk on kids. And so I think what, what you have to do as a prospective student athlete in high school is make sure that you are um, reaching out to that institution and that program and that staff and, and finding out, hey, is this something that you offer? And if so, you know, what does that process look like? You know, yeah. how, how realistic is it for, for me to come and walk on and make that team? And um, I think that if, if there's an opportunity for it, there's, there's no reason why you shouldn't do it. You know, yeah. I think that if you really want to go to that school because they have your major or financially it's a great fit for your family um, or, or for whatever reason, it, you, you know, you might have to have the opportunity to walk on. There's, there's nothing like, listen, when, when you walk on and make a team, it's not like for the next three or four years, you're just considered a walk on. Like you're, you're a member of that team, right? Yeah. There, you're, there's no difference between you and a kid that was recruited out of high school. Um, you know, you're, you're a member of that team. And so you're, you're going to be held to the same standard and expectation as everyone else. So, uh, yes, it is definitely an opportunity for, for all prospective student athletes at the next level. And, and with that being said, you know, it, it definitely varies and you have to do your research. Yeah. Okay. Um, what is, uh, a non what non athletic factors um, feature heavily in the recruiting process? Totally. And so I, I hit on it very briefly in the beginning. And so I'm excited that we get to talk about it a little bit more. And so, um, you know, obviously, in terms of non athletic factors, you know, the first thing that kind of, the first the first topic that always kind of comes up is is academics. Mm -hmm. um, and what I would tell tell any any young player is, is academically, you know, it can only help you it can it it, it, it Doing well in the classroom is never going to hurt you, right? It's only going to help you. So um, it can help you in so many different ways. It can help you athletically. It can also help you financially. And, and the athletic part is kind of funny because it's like, you know, I, I started out by saying, like, listen, if you can't play, mm -hmm. right, if you can't play at a high level and it, you're not going to probably play at a program, you know, a top caliber play, uh, program. But if maybe, let's say, a program is looking for a guy to fill in the last spot in their class, and they understand that they're not going to get a top caliber guy, a top 100 recruit or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to pick between, you know, maybe a mid-level recruit. Well, they're going to pick that kid that academically is better, is doing better in the classroom, right? Because that's going to add value to the locker room. That's going to hold guys to a higher standard. Um, that's going to boost your team GPA. Um, you know, it's just there's there's really there's a lot of good that comes out of it. And, and typically also kids that do well in school. That, that usually translate dire directly to the field, right? Yeah. If you're a kid that's doing really well in the classroom and you're working hard to get great grades, typically you're working really, really hard in the weight room. You're working really, really hard on the practice field. And so it kind of goes hand in hand. It's, it's very, very rare that you see a kid that doesn't really care about his schoolwork, doesn't work really, really hard in the classroom, and does really, really well out on the field, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's kind of like you know my mom always used to say, like, if you can't make the bed – you know, how, how are you, how are you going to play Friday nights, Friday night under the lights, right? Yeah. Like in front of 5,000 people for a band, you know, for your, your high school football team, you know, yeah. it's like, you got to be able to do the little things in order to do the big things, right? It doesn't get swept or swapped around. And so it's the same message that I think a lot of coaches tell their guys when going through the process. So 
academics is important. I think financially it's also huge because, you know, there's only 12.6 scholarships at the division one level per team per year. And so I think a lot of people get very confused and I think they're misguided in terms of what that number is. I think I've heard some people say, well, you know, it's 12.6 per class or, um, you know, it's 12.6, but there's some extra money that, that they can find through alum. And, and it's no, it's a hard number. It's 12.6. And not every division one team even has 12.6. And so, you know, when you break that down per class, it's that's really only three scholarships a class. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, three scholarships a class recruiting 10 to 15 kids a class. You know, there's only so much that goes around. And yeah. so if you're a parent that's investing in your kid to play club lacrosse and go to all these showcases and prospect days with the expectation that you're going to get all that money back in athletic scholarship, you've made a poor investment, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's not, there's no, you, what you're investing in is an experience um, and an opportunity for your, your young, your young, you know, your son or your daughter to go be a part of something that is going to help them become a better person when they leave college, when they leave their institution. And so, um, you know, academically, that might open the doors for some financial support that you wouldn't have because there is no money left in that class. Um, or maybe your family doesn't, um, you know, find, you know, is, isn't eligible for, any, for financial aid. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's really, really important that the academic part is, is, is really crucial. I mean, I can't tell you how many kids that we recruit that we don't have maybe any athletic scholarship left. And um, the only opportunity for them to get financial support would be through academics and they just don't have the grades to do it. And yeah. so, you know, our school or any other school may not be an opportunity, may not be an option for them. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, that's really important. Some other non-athletic factors, um, you know, it's so general, but I think just understanding like how to be a great person, you know, I think, um, it's just in today's world. It's, you, you can get caught up in social media in, in terms of, you know, what's important to you and your values and, you know, at the end of the day, if, if you're coming to an institution to, or if you're going to an institution to play a collegiate sport, regardless mm -hmm. of the sport, and you're anticipating an experience that includes, uh, you know, maybe 60% academics and 40, you know, 30% act, you know, uh, athletics and, or, or yeah, and 10% social, like you're, you're probably not, you're not, the, you're not looking at the right things. Like you, one of those three things have to be removed right and it's obviously it's not gonna be athletics and it's not gonna be academics yeah um, so you know it, it is a grind to play college sports and um you know some people say grind is, isn't the greatest word to use but um it's it, it is it's really really hard it's it's a full-time job and then some i mean some of these guys between academics athletics community service you know whatever it is that they're they're involved in they're, they're putting in 50 to 60 hours a week yeah um and so i think being a a well-rounded person is really important being able to to juggle multiple, you know, roles, um, being a multi-sport athlete, being a great student, being a great brother, a great, a great son or daughter uh, or sister. You know, I think those things are really, really important, um, in terms of just being recruited in the process. I mean, I, I know a lot of coaches will ask kids, you know, what else do you do other than play lacrosse? What else do you do besides, uh, you know, do well in the classroom? You know, what, what do you enjoy doing? You know, I met a kid the other day that enjoys oil painting, you know, yeah. it's like, that's really interesting. You know, that's cool. Um, so, you know, I think those those are some key non-athletic factors um, that, that definitely help in terms of the recruiting process. Yeah, that's interesting. It, it kind of made me laugh because when you're talking about if you can make the bed, I remember, um, don't know if you'll appreciate this or not, because I remember attending uh, Linganor practice in the preseason yeah. back in the day. What are your, your guys' big rival <laughs> back then? Yep. Um, and Coach Connor was talking, he was talking to his kids and he was like, you know what, he's like, I hate the kids that are sloppy in life because they're sloppy in practice and they're sloppy in games. And he was like, you know, give me, it, it kind of speaks to that thing. It's like you, you practice how you play, like the kind of the things, yep. things follow you through. If you let things slide just in your day to day, you tend to let things slide in other areas. So he's kind of speaking to that, you know, absolutely the kind of player, the kind of person you want to be will you know, kind of translate to the field as Absolutely. well and i mean i think you know i mean i i worked full time and to help pay my way through college and kind of because of that i mean and full time you know athletics is a full time job for most of these guys like they spend you know almost how much time on the road and you know practice and trying to cram for studies and stuff like that and i mean obviously the academics part that doesn't go away like <laughs> oh, if yeah. they, and if it does you won't be doing Not the rest playing. of it for very long yeah. um but you know it's like one of those for me it was you know, this, the social stuff, like there was things that happened at campus that I just, I was like, well, I don't get to do that. Cause I got to work and I got to, you know, study for finals and I got to do all that stuff. Like it's gotta be the same for your the college kids. Like 
Absolutely. You're, you're doing this stuff. So it's like if you want to live the, you know, the uh, uh, National Lampoon's uh, <laughs> frat house life and play college athletics and academics, like that's just not, that is probably not for you. Like, totally. It's just, you yeah. To... I mean, I'll, I'll steal a, a quote from Coach, Coach Noah Fosner. He's our defensive coordinator at, at the University of Delaware. Um, great friend. He always says, he says, it, it all bleeds through, right? right? So, you know, if there's something in your life that you're not taking care of in some way, shape, or form along, along the line, it may not happen right away, it is going to impact another aspect of your life. Um, and I think for, for young kids right now, and it's really hard to do in high school because you're just, you're pressured by so many different things that are going on, whether it's social media and, you know, seeing that this kid's ranked you know, uh, you know, this, this, you know, he's number, the number five recruit in the country, or, yeah. you know, your high school isn't in, in the top 10, or, you know, you see what your friends that maybe aren't playing sports are doing. You know, I think it's important for kids today to really sit back and take a moment. And I think talking to your parents is a great way to do it or, or any mentor really, you know, what do you value in life, right? As a high school student, like what is, what is truly important to you? Um, and these are things that, you know, I do as an adult and I'm sure you do as an adult, like there's only so many things that you can value yeah. each day. And so, you know, taking the time to say, okay, what are the two or three things that are really, really important to me? And if you want to do real, if you want to take care of those things, um, at the highest level that you possibly can achieve, like you, there can't be distractions, right? You can't, you can't divvy those things out amongst six or seven different values. It's gotta be, you know, what's important to you. So like, you know, if you're a high school kid that's looking to get recruited, your values should be doing well in the classroom competing on the field or competing really in anything that you do yeah. um, and being a great person, right? And bring it, being and all of those things are going to include a lot of other little aspects of your life in terms of doing your chores when your parents ask you and doing what's asked of you in school and being a great student, being a great leader and a role model and, you know, being the first guy at practice and the last guy to leave. And so I think that if kids can sit down and really start to think about what do they value, because if you value being social as a high school player, you're probably going to value that as well yeah. as a college player. And so maybe playing a collegiate sport isn't in your best interest or playing at a very high level. If you don't love practice, then playing a division one sport or, or really a college sport at all, you know, division one, division two, division three is, is, is the right path. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you don't like practicing every day for 365 days of the year. Like, you know, whether it's with a team or on your own college sports may not be something that, that you that you want to to you want to go after, and I think that's something that kids really have to think about. There's so many parents I think that push their kids towards that college dream of playing a sport. Um, and you know, I always this one's oh this is funny. We'll move on to the next question after I mention this, but it always makes me laugh when a college coach is like, "Yeah, I, I reached out to so and so, uh, and you know, I saw him at this tournament or I saw him in this high school game, and he doesn't want to play college lacrosse. Like, I can't believe he doesn't want to play college lacrosse. Like, he's." he's such a great player. And it's like, well, maybe he's just playing cause he enjoys the game. You know, yeah. like maybe he's playing with his friends. Like how crazy of an idea is that? Like just because you play a high school sport and you don't want to get recruited, like, wow, like who, who would have thought, you know, like yeah. that's okay. That is okay. That's okay to play a sport and not have aspirations to play it in college. That, yeah. That's completely okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, good, good point to make, you know, it's not, doesn't have to be the end all be all. Cause uh, what's the NCAA saying? Most of our players will go pro in something something else other than yeah, yeah. Totally. <laughs> you, know, I, you know a stat i mean only two percent of high school lacrosse players go on to play division one lacrosse yeah two percent so i mean you go to it like you know, i always put that in perspective for kids at a camp like you just show up there's 100 kids i'm like all right 100 kids I'm like two of you raise your hand you know two kids raise their hands i'm like great those the, everyone take a look around like that's probably the number of kids from this group that are going to go play division one lacrosse yeah all right put that in perspective guys like that it's really hard yeah. You know, and, and, and if you trickle it down to D2, D3, all the other options, it's still, I mean, the number is, is so, is so minuscule. It's, it's, you know, it, it's, it is difficult. It's, it's very, it's a tough, it, it's not easy with, with that being said in the end, right. You, you achieve something that's, that's really special, you know, and you yeah. experience something that's very special. So, um, it is worth it. You know, it, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so kind of wrapping up the questions that I have prepared and then we'll get to a few of the, I guess, hopefully quick hitters from Instagram. But, um, you know, what's the number one thing that a recruit can do, um, to make themselves the most recruitable player possible? And I know there's not one thing, but you know, if you had to pick one thing, which I'm asking you to pick one thing, um, what's the one thing that can make a kid stand out to make them the most recruitable player? Totally. Uh, so I would say own your process. Um, and, and, by, and what that means, you know, obviously it's a very general response, but that that basically encompasses a couple of things that I think that will allow most kids to really um, be efficient and, and not only efficient, but enjoy their process. And so when I say own your process, like don't compare your process to someone else. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, everyone's process is different, right? Every kid is recruited in a different way. Their timeline's different. Um, you know, there's so many different variables. So own your process, own everything from how you prepare leading up to the day that you can finally be recruited to when you're in, in the moment and you are being recruited. Um, and then once you've maybe made your decision, whether it's a verbal decision or you're signing an LI or, you know, at like the D3 level, there is no contra- contractual agreement. But, you know, once you've maybe made your deposit or you've committed to the admissions process, you know, then that's the next chapter of owning your process of preparing yourself now to be the best teammate you can be. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think like, you know, if, if there's I kind of like to think like if you're a young kid and you want to write something on a sticky note and put it next to your bed so that every morning when you wake up, you're reminding yourself of one message. It's to own your process. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that learning to think that way and, and to, to hold yourself accountable. college and even in college they help you so much um i think learning just to be accountable for yourself and for for your own responsibilities um you know i think that's that's super important um and and obviously again very general response but i think that if you can apply that to every aspect of your life and what you're doing through your process you'll find that as long as you're thinking that way all the time you're going to be all right you're going to end up all right yeah and i think that speaks to something you said before as far as you know kind of uh not getting caught up in other other things that you can't control um you know like somebody totally. like you mentioned like you know the you know you're not you know whatever ranked player and stuff like that like that's out of a player's control like they don't get to decide like oh i'm gonna Absolutely. be the number one or number five or number 50 recruit in the nation like that's other people are deciding that you don't get to control that but you can get to control like how you're playing how you're acting like all the things that we've kind of talked about on on this podcast is the stuff you can control and if you do all those well and well enough you know that stuff kind of being a bribe byproduct of no of doubt hard work yeah I mean, no doubt i mean control of controllables right i mean that's yeah. something i say t- i say to my guys all the time like there's and, and that's in life too i mean there's things in life that are going to happen and you whether they're good or bad and you have an opportunity to respond to those things and how you respond right and i'm kind of stealing something here from from uh from something that i that i was involved with at ohio state as a player but you know your event plus response equals outcome um you know that's talked a lot about today and in, in, on social media and in, th- in different athletic programs but your outcome is dictated upon your response. And so yeah. you're right. I mean, focus on the things that you can control. You can control getting up an hour early uh, and getting to school an hour early and hitting the wall for an extra hour every day. You can yeah. control staying in the weight room for an extra 15, 20 minutes working on something that's specific to your position. You can control putting in an extra 10 minutes of studying every night. Like those are things that you control and that no one else can can take away from you, right? And effort. Yeah. Right? It all comes down to effort. So effort and commitment. Right? Yeah. Um so that's that's again that it kind of it nicely goes into owning your process, right? Like if yeah. you're if you're not going to work at a Division one level as a high school uh, you know prospective student athlete, then you're probably not going to achieve that. Same yeah. goes for the Division two and Division three level, or just playing a collegiate sport. If you're not going to train and prepare yourself to play at that level, then you probably won't achieve that goal. Um, yeah. So okay. that's a great point. Okay. Um, now we're kind of kind of get into a few of the we'll call it the lightning round because <laughs> these are questions yeah, like- that uh, we solicited I solicited off uh, Instagram. Um, we won't hit all of them because I think we've covered some of this stuff already. Um, but one of the uh, players asked, was like, what's the most popular time and year for a high schooler to get D1 contact? Now, totally. I know obviously the September 1st of junior year is as far as like contact, but um, trying to understand his question. But if you get it, go ahead. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so, yeah. So be, based off the new rule, and I think it's important for people to understand that up until I want to say it was uh, April 2017, I believe, up until April 2017, uh, the way the the recruiting world kind of worked in terms of the lacrosse world and at the Division One level, right? You could reach out to a college coach via you know phone call. That coach could pick it up, and you could have a recruiting conversation. Whereas mm-hmm. now that that can no longer happen. So some examples that I like to always give to kids: if you're if you are a prospective student athlete that has not you know reached September one of your junior year. You show up on campus because you want to do a campus tour on your own and you walk to the lacrosse offices and you go in and introduce yourself and coach asks you, what year are you? And you say you're a sophomore freshman. Guess what? You're going to have a really awkward response and a coach is going to say, hey, listen, you got to leave or I can't talk to you. Same thing goes if you call and he picks up the phone. And that's honestly why I think a lot of college coaches just aren't picking up their phone anymore because they just don't want to have that awkward conversation. Yeah. Um, and so September one of your junior year uh, in terms of the division one level, that is really that's that's when it all begins. And you know, that the, the new rule is great, but one of the, uh, I guess, 
um, negative responses or results from that rule is that that's also a really busy time of a prospective student athlete's high school career. You know, that for a lot of kids might be the first time they're playing a varsity sport or mm-hmm. taking their first AP class or taking their first SAT or ACT um, uh, test. And so be prepared to have to kind of do things on the fly and make sure that you're preparing yourself for that date so that if a phone call does come, that you are squared away with all the other things that are going on in your life, um, especially at that time in your life when you have a lot of things going on. Yeah. Um, and so that that's when things really pick up. I think it's important to also note that just because you don't get a phone call in September 1 of your junior year doesn't mean that um, you're out of luck, that the yeah. Division One dream is is gone. I mean, there are kids that, you know, I've, I've had the, the fortune of coaching a club program. I ran a club program for multiple years. I've been a high school head coach. I've been a college coach. I have seen kids that have committed to play Division One lacrosse at Big Ten, top ten institutions, um, ACC, you know, May of their senior year. So – they're like done playing senior, yeah. their senior cross, and they're having they're give, they're being offered the opportunity to go play Division One lacrosse. So, the way I look at it, college coaches they don't stop recruiting a kid until they have submitted their deposit to a school, sent, signed an LI, or stepped foot on another campus. You know, and and so you're recruitable all the way through. Um, but I would say September one of your junior year, and then you know with Division three they can recruit you whenever. There's it's the wild wild west. They can recruit you as a freshman in high school if they want. Um, that's not happening. But that is that is a reality that that could happen. Um, and so, you know, it does. The chain line, timeline does change a little bit per division. MCLA, same thing. They can recruit you as a middle schooler if they want. But <laughs> I think making sure that you're prepared for that September one date, that that's that's extremely important. OK, um, kind of covered some of this. Uh, a couple of people actually asked what um, you guys look for in a in a FOGO or a face off guy. Yeah, so I think at the college level, the, that position, it's, it's funny, you know, you have so many different college, uh, coaches at different levels talk about, you know, a face-off position. You know, I was a face-off guy, and so I'm definitely a little biased. Um, you know, I, I think that it's, it's a great position. I think it's a great aspect of our game. Um, it's very unique. You know, I think that people mm-hmm. talk about, well, it, they, you don't have a position like that in other sports. Well, that, that to me is actually kind of a positive. You know, I think that's, that's what makes our sport special. And so, um, you know, are there certain scenarios where guys, um, maybe are, you know, anomalies or they're, they're one offs, like a guy like Trevor Baptiste or TD Erling guys that just absolutely dominate their position. Alex Woodall is another guy. Um, absolutely. But like, Hey, listen, there's Michael Jordan's that came along too. And we didn't get rid of his position, right? (laughs) Right. So because he dominated everyone, um, and so, or like a Pat Spencer who can score at will, like we're not getting rid of his position. And so yeah. the position position special. And I think because it is so special and it's become so important, I think that in today's world, it's very important that yes, it is a specialized position and it's very skillful and technical, but I think because it's becoming so important, it is important for kids to be very athletic. I think I played, um, during a time where the position was more skill specific and more technical and you did see a couple guys get by that weren't as athletic. Like mm-hmm. I would consider myself a maybe above average athlete, but not an elite athlete. Um, and I think in today's world, I would probably not be a division one athlete, which means I probably would not be a division one face off guy. Yeah. Um, so I think it's important to make sure that you are training um, not to just specifically be a face off guy, but a division one athlete in a division one lacrosse player. It drives me insane it drives coaches insane at all levels when you go watch a high school player literally run on the field to face off and run off the field. Like, play offense, play defense. You know, as a high school player, I played offense and defense. I didn't just face off. Yeah. Um, I think that's super important because those skills um, that you'll develop as an offensive and defensive player at the high school level are going to help you at the college level, whether it's taking care of the ball and getting in possession for your team or getting stuck on defense because teams are – you know, playing subbing games and you're all of a sudden stuck and having to match up on a guy who's dodging to the goal. Those, you know, being able to ride and clear and not have to manipulate a team's ride or clear package because you're a face-off guy. I mean, those things are so important. Um, you know, and who's to say you get there and all of a sudden you're not a face-off guy and now they need you to play defense, right? Yeah. You know, that, that's also important. Um, yeah, being flexible so, is not going to hurt you. <laughs> yeah, so I think, you know, the last piece of the face-off part too is um, making sure that you are – Take, taking note of how many reps you're, you're, you're taking. I think so many kids now are almost overusing their bodies and are mm-hmm. facing off too much in high school and they're getting to college and you're seeing so many shoulder injuries. Um, so I think that, you know, training more in the weight room and less out on the turf, or mm-hmm. if you are out on the turf, not necessarily taking a live face off and working more on your own craft. I think that's really important. 
Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't know if this applies, but I remember talking to Justin Shockey dur- and during his senior year um, at Landon. Obviously, he dominated when he was at Landon. And then totally. one of the things that got me is he uh, his hobby or pastime was whitewater rafting. Yeah. Uh, or no, it was or rowing. I can't remember exactly. Rowing. I have it in the story, but he said that, like he attributed a lot of his skills in the faceoff was to that because of the wrist. Like he it helped him. Yeah. And he was like, oh, you know, it was it was kind of a break. It wasn't facing off, but it helped Absolutely. strengthen those areas. And I mean, that's not why he did it or got into it. It just happened to be a byproduct of something he enjoyed. But you know, I've heard uh, other kids talking about you know, wrestling and other sports that wrestling, yep. require the movements and stuff like that. Kind of kind of help you. So I mean, you spoke to the multi-sport athlete before yeah. but also that overuse i think that applies to almost any sport um you know totally. that overuse injuries you can kind of do the same thing over and over you tend to get those injuries in those areas so you know find something you love to do that might actually help you as as well and that Absolutely. could be you know something kind of give your body a little bit of a break but also kind of help um again um okay we got uh we'll ask this one it seems like a pretty quick question if a kid doesn't work out is he recruitable yeah, so I mean, I, obviously, it's a it's a difficult question to respond to without saying like, of course, you have to to work out. I think, you know, what's more important uh, if if you're playing three sports a year, right? You're playing sports all year round. So you're a football player, you're a basketball player, you're a lacrosse player. You know, it is going to be hard for you to find time to dedicate uh, yourself to the weight room, right? Mm-hmm. And so, like, if you are a guy that's playing multiple sports and you're up front with your coach, you say, listen, I just haven't had as much of an opportunity to train in the weight room because I'm playing sports. I mean, when you think about it, you know, football starts in August as a high school player, you do that all the way up, all the way up until the end of November. And then basketball starts the last week of November. And then you're doing that all the way up until, you know, the end of February. And then lacrosse starts the first week of March. And then that goes all the way to the summer. And now you're playing club. It's like, yeah, I mean, I I could totally understand it. But if you're not a multi-sport athlete, I think training, you know, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in the weight room, but even as simple as like, jumping rope and, and, you know, uh, using ladders and, and cone work and, and hill sprints and hitting the wall, um, things of that nature. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't mean you have to get in the, in the squat rack and be able to squat 400 pounds, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's not necessarily beneficial to our sport at every position, you know, um, plyometrics, you know, plyo training is probably more specific to lacrosse being able to, you know, work really, really, really hard for 20 to 30 seconds and then continue to go for another 10 and then go really, really hard for 20, 30 seconds. It's not like football where you're on and off. It's right. more so keeping a pace and at times having to elevate, you know, your, your cardio um, or your muscular endurance. I think that you do need to train in some aspect, but it doesn't mean you got to be, you know, throwing up a ton of weight in the weight room. Yeah. And I think, you know, for your point, if kids are playing those multi sports, if you're basically playing sports from the time you get to, you know, you start your junior, senior year, whatever, and go to the end, like, you're probably working out in the weight room as part of those sports to begin with, but I think if uh, you're sitting, going home and you're playing Fortnite for three, four hours yeah. per night, probably not going to play D1 across if that's where your priorities are, and yeah. I think to your point, like, sometimes that's fine if that's what you want to do. Obviously, there's kids making thousands and millions of dollars playing Fortnite online, but, you know, it's like you kind of got to, you know, you're going to have to dedicate yourself to that and not yep. chase a D1 lacrosse streams. Like, you know, I mean, yeah. pick, you, we pick saw... your priorities. What's pri- What do you prioritize? Yeah. What, what do you value, right? Same thing we were talking about earlier. You know, you can only value so much. If you value Fortnite, then something's got to give. Um, yeah. You know, and I would tell you as a college athlete, there weren't a lot of video games played. And if they were, it was, you know, on Friday night when everyone else on campus was going out and we were, we had a game the next day, you know, and yeah. your academics were done. And so you had nothing else to do than to play maybe FIFA for 10 minutes with your, with your roommates before you went to bed. Yeah. Um, so there's definitely not a, a lot of gaming going on to the next level. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, it kind of tells it for all the questions. Is there anything that um, I didn't cover that you feel is important to, to talk about? Anything I left out? That I, yeah. One thing I would just love to end on, and it's something that my parents just, they did such a great job of reminding me this consistently throughout the process. Um, and I try to remind kids this as well. When I, when I talk to them or walk them through the process, whether it's as like their mentor or as a coach, you know, enjoy the process. I mean, no doubt it's going to be stressful. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's such a fun and exciting time. I mean, when you really think about it, you know, you're, you're being sought after by college coaches that want you to be a part of their locker room and they want you to come and, and add value to what, what they already got going on. And so 
take a moment, you know, to, to take that in and enjoy that. And when you're on campus, don't feel so stressed to ask the right question. You know, be, don't be afraid just to, to put it all out there and, and act yourself and, and ask those difficult questions because that's what we want to see as coaches. You know, we want to know what kind of kid you are. We want to dig in and find out what makes you tick. Um, because we want to make sure that when you do come to our program, whether it's D1, D2, D3, that it's going to be a great fit. You know, we want you to enjoy your time. We want you to be able to get the most out of the, the experience. And so enjoy the process. I mean, it, it, it's going to be different for everyone. And as long as you are able to control the controllables, you know, align your values for what you're looking for um, and just enjoy it all, you know, you're, you're going to have a lot of fun. Yeah. All right. I think that's a perfect way to end it, Coach. I cannot thank you enough for uh, for joining me today. Um, I'll make sure to, to link to the University of Delaware's pro, you know prospect questionnaire because uh, I know we talked yeah, about that. And it. if you guys have your prospect day, you know that's another one of the things. Like every coach that I talk to always mentions that. Like if those are if you're interested in the University of Delaware, that's probably the best way to guarantee that you're going to get no seen by by the coaches there. So, uh, Coach, thank you again so much. I really appreciate it, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. I appreciate it, Mike. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching this week's video. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And if you could, hit that thumbs up and leave a like. It really does help out the channel. And again, if you enjoyed this video, you may enjoy one of our other video podcasts. And you can check those out by clicking the link above. Everybody, have a fantastic week.